It seems like he was trying to avoid heavy ice. Well, so he hits the reef instead. But what's Alieska doing? They're supposed to launch the emergency response. Larry Shire is on his way to the terminal right now to mobilize his guys. I'm sending a boat to the ship. You ready? You bet. You bet I'm ready. This could be a pollution disaster. The first thing I need to know is exactly how much oil she's losing. I told Alieska we're going to need chemical dispersants. They reckon they have 50 drones at the terminal. 50? Is that all? The contingency plan says they're supposed to have damn near 400. I know. I told them to get more, wherever they could find it. Just hope these Alieska guys are on top of this thing. Are you sure? She's lost how much? Six million gallons. I'm trying to take control of the cleanup. What is that going to try to uh, We'll have to get together at some point, sir, to uh, talk about testing these dispersants. Tested. What the hell? I thought we had to go ahead. Frank, I, I think they're ready for you now. Ew. The major navigational hazard is Valdez Narrows. That is where we concentrate our radar coverage. We do not have cover all the way into the sound. Yes, ma'am. Are you saying, then, that the tanker couldn't be seen on radar? No, ma'am. What I'm saying is, at that time, the radar watch did not have the vessel under constant surveillance. Why not? Well, it's not mandated. Not according to U.S. traffic rules. Well, was the radar set to the range that the operator, if he was watching the screen, could have seen the ship? Well, those are questions which will have to be resolved by the investigation. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name is Jack Lamb. Uh, I'm vice president of Cordova Fishermen United. I've been fishing in this area for about 20 years. I would have assumed that when a tanker requests permission to deviate from the standard tanker lanes, it's at least monitored on radar during that time. Well, he was in radio contact. He reported no problems. No other traffic was bowed at the time. Visibility was good. All he did was ask permission to go from the outbound lane to the inbound. And that's really routine. Oh, yeah. Well, he's sure as hell not in that lane now, is he? <laughs> that's correct. Damn it, I have to go back. I forgot the video camera. What? I have to be able to show the results. This is a dispersion test, remember? It's gonna be too dark if we don't hurry this up. What's with all this testing? Anyway, let's just do it. He can call what he likes. Frankly, once we get up there, we drop as much of the damn stuff as we can. again. Ready? Boom's on. That's good. You're looking real good. Do you see where the light is reflecting better off where they just sprayed? That's because the dispersant is breaking up the oil. You see that, Commander? I'm not sure. It's not showing very clearly through the camera. If you put the camera down, you can see it better. Look, there's a path a mile long right, right through the middle of the slick. I don't think it's going to show much on the video. The light's too low. You just have to look. It's all there. It's no good, Frank. If I can't show the test, other people won't be able to evaluate if we should go ahead. Well, let's check with Kelso's guys in the observation chopper. DC? DC, how is that for you guys? We're not sure, Dr. Lindblom. Some of the guys here are saying they think the plane may have sprayed over water, not oil. There's nothing to say that I can't continue testing as long as it takes. If you guys want to try another trial run tomorrow, it's fine with me. We do get a permit for today's test until almost 2 o'clock, Commander. That process has got to be speeded up. Well, your spray plane from Anchorage didn't arrive till nearly 4 o'clock. Underlining growing national concern for the spill was the arrival in Valdez today of Rear Admiral Edward Nelson, Jr., commander of the Alaska Coast Guard. There was speculation that the Admiral would be taking over from Commander Steve McCall as the federal on-scene coordinator. But Nelson denied this. Frank Iorossi has impressed on me the urgency of a clear-cut decision on the use of dispersants. I have to say, I think he's right. We've got a heck of a big spill out there. We could skim forever, Denny, and still not get rid of it. Okay, mechanical cleanup is maybe not the whole answer. But we still feel that dispersants should only be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. We are not ready to sign off on its open-ended use. I just think we need to be careful here, that's all. We're being so damn careful that nobody is actually doing anything. No. 
It's a trade-off between the damage the dispersant could cause and the oil washing up on the beaches. Look, the dispersant we're using is EPA approved. It is completely safe. And after the latest tests, we believe it is now working effectively on the oil. You can't just ignore it. Oh, wait a minute. You're forgetting. You're the guys who've been promising to send boom and stuff up here to protect the shoreline, huh? Where is it? There are a hundred square miles of oil out there. No amount of equipment is going to deal with that. And whose fault is that, huh? If the oil industry had been prepared in the first place, we wouldn't even be sitting here. Well, I take it then, gentlemen, uh, madam, that we have agreement to use dispersant in Zone 1? Okay, you can start first off tomorrow. Only don't get too carried away. I'd recommend that you stick just to the leading edge of Zone 1. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this, the first of our new operations group meetings. Uh, to begin, I think the, the best way... Just a minute, Steve. I'm not sure we should go ahead while there are outsiders present. Hey, excuse me, Ed. These guys are with me. I asked them to come along tonight because, uh, well, they're all of them local fishermen from this area, and uh, well, they have some practical proposals about this cleanup. I think we ought to listen to them. Okay. Let's see what you got to say. But we learned today that the slick is not just moving south into Montague Strait. We, we expected that. But what's new is it's also pushing out here to the west. That spells disaster. It could wipe out the entire fishing industry in Prince William Sound. See, we've got four major hatcheries in this area. One here at Esther Island, another one at uh, Main Bay, third one at Ashami Bay, and another one at Sawmill Bay. Now, in two weeks, those hatcheries have got to release their salmon fry. Millions of them. And well, they'll be releasing them straight into that oil. The truth is, we're never going to catch the slick now. So we have to focus our efforts on something we can do. We can defend the hatcheries if we put all our resources at their disposal. I know it's only a drop in the ocean compared to the enormity of the problem. But at least if we lose everything else in the sound, the hatcheries can restock the fishing for future generations. Look at it like this. When you're down to nothing, you've got nothing to lose. All you can do is go for it. Okay. We can get your boom. How soon can your people have boats available? Well, they're ready now. Now? This minute? I have been telling you people from first light of day one, Mr. Ayarasi, that we have got boats and crews standing by in Cordoba ready to go. I just have to call them. They'll be on their way. All right. I'll take them all in one whack. Now, wait a minute. These guys are going to need a lot of backup. I didn't put any limit on this. You tell me what you need, you got it. I'll tell him to leave right now. Looks like a bunch of fishermen just got these boys off the hook.